We're generating so much data now, Twitter, Facebook, every hour, every minute, every second, every millisecond, huge amounts of data pouring into the world. And it's creating this vast ocean of data that we don't know necessarily what to do with. And it creates this metaphor that I hear a lot in this world, which is that data is the new oil. It's this idea, this ubiquitous resource that we can mine for insight and, um, and for development. And I think it's a good metaphor, but I would modify it slightly. And I would say, well, for me anyway, data is the new soil. Because for me, it feels like a new kind of material. You can get your hands dirty with, you can dig through, you can till. You know, and if you treat it in the right way, then visualizations, infographics, they're like um, flowers that can bloom from this soil. The problem with a lot of data is, though, that it's quite dull, it's quite boring, it's quite sort of, there doesn't seem to be anything there, and the answers it gives are often obvious. So for instance, um, I had this question, which is, you'll be able to guess instantly, I'm sure, who has the biggest military budget in the world? USA, yes, exactly, there it is, $711 billion a year, and they're the other top military budgets in the world. And that is a vast figure, and it's so vast it can contain all those other budgets inside itself. A couple of other numbers there to contextualize that. Now, you might see that figure, and that, you might have a reaction. You might think that might chime with a political view you have of America as some kind of industrial military complex, you know, out to overtake the world in some way. But is it true that America has the world's largest military budget? Because you have to consider, you have to take into consider consideration, America has a vast economy. It's a fabulously wealthy country. So wealthy, it can contain the other two top industrialized nations' economies inside itself. It's massively wealthy. So its military budget is bound to be massively disproportionately larger. So to be fairer and to be more accurate, we have to bring in another data set and we have to say, well, actually, who spends the most as a percentage of their earnings, as a percentage of their GDP? So if you do that, you get a different picture. These other countries that were invisible because we were looking at this absolute figure spring into view, and the USA actually drops to sixth. We're in this connected world now, so we, can't, we can no longer take a single data point or a single number and claim truth. We have to link it to other data points to enrich the picture, to connect it up, to get a clearer picture, more connected picture. So I've been designing for about five or six years. Never been to art school, never been to design school, never trained as a designer. I just like to learn by picking things up and just playing with them, uh, learning from my mistakes. Um, it was interesting, though, when I started designing, I discovered something about myself. I was actually already okay at it, like I could do it. Not I was brilliant, but like I had an innate sense of color, space, and typography in me. And I thought, I think because I've been exposed to all this media in my career, it sunk in. It was sort of latent in me. And I don't think I'm unique. I think this is happening to all of us now. I think every day we're being exposed to an information design medium, the internet. And it's training us to relate information and design together. So much so that now one relies on the other. So you think about how you might visit a badly designed website and how little you would trust the information on that website. Visit a glossy website, how little you might question the information on that website. The two go hand in hand, information and visualization together. We're all visualizers. And I wonder if there isn't something cognitive about that. We're sort of pattern hunters. We're um, always hunting for variations in color, pattern, and shape. That's the language of the eye, color, pattern, and shape. It's instinctive. Three out of four neurons in our brain is dedicated to the visual system. The visual language is ancient. You know, there were infographics back in 1860. Some of you might know this. Joseph Minard, Visualization of Napoleon's March to Russia and back. The thickness here is the, is the number of soldiers he has. It instantly depicts the tragedy of that campaign. Florence Nightingale used to create these amazing graphics to try and influence her superiors. Uh, isotype was a visual language that emerged in the 40s. It never really took off, but it was literally just visualization of statistics. And this is a graphic from 1890 Statistical Survey of the US. So there's been a visual drive in culture to visualize information for a long time. So yeah, we have this language of the eye, that color, pe pattern, shape. And you combine it with the language of the mind, numbers, ideas, words, stories. You're able to speak two languages simultaneously. That's what happens in an information visualization. You're actually addressing two circuits in the brain. You're speaking two languages. A little snapshot of what's happening in the telecoms industry. <laughs> Bit of a bun fight. Everyone's suing everyone else. Let me tell you something about this image. The blocks here are, is yearly revenue in billions. And com companies in the black, black companies have increasing revenue year on year. Red companies have decreasing revenue year on year. And in the speech bubbles are the reasons why each one is suing the other. So I can take those off. So we can drop down now to the, we're just on the language of the eye, well, 
we've got some concepts where we're dropping more onto the visual layer, go even further, now we're just on the visual layer, and actually on this layer, your eye is exquisitely placed to answer two questions. Is there a relationship between decreasing revenue and increasing litigiousness? Is there a relationship between size of company and increasing litigiousness? Now, that's not necessarily something you could see instantly in a spreadsheet, but you can perceive it quite quickly here. Layer on some concepts, layer on a story, and suddenly you've got an image that's working on multiple levels simultaneously. Hopefully, if you designed it well, those layers are in interfering with each other. So you can take a satellite photo of your data and see it from above and see what it looks like all laid out. Um, I did this little sequence for the UN on drug use, drug use per capita, the biggest drug using countries per person. <coughs> So I created this little tour. So these are the top drug using countries, the top eight for each drug. So this is cocaine. This is cannabis. You can see a lot of Australia in this. <laughs> uh, this is your uh, ecstasy. Quite a lot of Spain as well, actually. Um, amphetamines, so drifting off east now. Then we have a snapshot of the opiate, biggest opiate using countries, quite depressing. The smokers. And then finally, the drunks. <laughs> so you don't have to show all your data. Often the interesting bit is at the top, you know, the top layer, the foam, if you like, is there. And, and I think a lot of people fall in a trap when they have data, they visualize it all. You know, I've got to show it all. But actually the interesting stuff is often just, you know, in, a, in between two thresholds. So we're up high with this camera, seeing overviews, but we can also crash zoom, so we can just see little numbers, little statistics that can reveal a lot about a whole world. This is a graphic about the Twitter community created around the IPO they did last year, 238 million active users. How many of those are active in the sense we might understand? The different perspective there on that, that world. And sometimes a little number can say a lot. It's quite fun doing this graphic. I often sketch my graphics, and here this is an example. As you can see, it's bad, badly sketched, but 100 million was sounded so big in my mind. And it is, it's a huge amount of money. But I got it way out of scale, like the billions. And that made me think, I wonder if that's used at all. That's interesting. So I had a look around and I found this. President Obama announced the federal budget of the USA. That's the amount of money needed to run the government apparatus of America. 3,500 billion. And at the same time, he said, well, it's a time of austerity, so I'm going to cut 100 million. And everyone's like, yeah, 100 million. That's a lot of money. Let's cut that. So let's just do that, shall we? 3,500 uh, US federal budget, which is more, pretty much the economy of Germany, just to run the American country, 3,500 billion, and we'll cut 100 million. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever you hear 100 million on the radio or in the paper, you know, wake up, whoa, that's your meerkat moment, you need to pay attention, somebody is distracting you. So we're up high and we can crash zoom, and we can also like go wide, you know, do a wide shot of data. Sometimes you want to see all the data, you do want to see it because it's worth it, or it's just interesting, or it's beautiful. Um, so the wide shot really ha is really lovely. So um, this, is, this next image I didn't create, it's by Dink Berry of datagenetics.com. It's a visualization from a data breach of all the four digit passcodes that people choose. It's a heat map here. So the, the, the first two digits are up the left and along the bottom are the second two digits. So your diagonal line there is people doing one, 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 two, 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 two double digits. The line around the 19 line, that line across horizontally is the 19 lines people using their birth year, 1965, 1976, and so on. The heat in the bottom left corner is people using their birth date, month date, so it doesn't go over 31, so it's concentrated in that area. And there are three numbers that are the most popular. One, two, three, four. Uh, four, three, two, one. <laughs> and two, five, eight, zero. Why two, five, eight, zero? Yep, straight down the middle. So there you go. Just a beautiful depiction of our predictability. And the wide shot actually takes me into knowledge. So I've been showing you a bit of information, I've been showing you a bit of data. I want to just explore knowledge with you for a minute, as distinct from data and information. Um, and a traditional way of depicting this relationship is a bit like this. So you get a sense of decreasing amount of knowledge. And, but I think it doesn't, this doesn't quite work, it doesn't convey the qualities of each of these substances, if you like. And I was saying that data was like soil, so it's like particular, it's dots, you know, you talk about data points. And then information is like strands and blocks, and <coughs> bytes and chunks of information, bits of information. And then knowledge, to me, may be a bit more web-like and connected, you know, more like a network. Um, and that maybe is how you imagine it. Um, so I sort of, Visualize it like this, and this is my guiding principle for the book. And this is more helpful, I think, because it shows how 
they differ, but how one relates to the other. And you can see there's a process needed in between to convert one into the other, to convert data into information knowledge. You, know, you gather data and structure it, and then you arrange it and link it to make um, information and knowledge. But I found that it didn't quite, this didn't quite fit. So as I was exploring, I found some other it, sort of interim states of these, inf these materials that were m missing from our language or, or we don't often pay attention to. So yes, you start with data and it's particular and you mine and you capture and you collect it. But when you do that, it doesn't create information. It actually creates structured data. So like tables, spreadsheets, databases, these kind of things that we have in the modern world. And then when you identify and you filter and you interpret that, it becomes more understandable, more communicable, and then you get information, which is structured and ordered. And information is distinctive because you can ingest it, you can kind of digest it and take it in. And then in recent years, we've been able to combine and connect and interlink information to create linked information. So hypertext is a, an example. But this was still not in knowledge because interlinked information is not knowledge in a way the web is not yet knowledge. It requires an additional step of like contextualizing and building a boundary around it, packing it all into a space. And then you start getting knowledge, which is more cellular. You know, you've got all the information knowledge of a subject sort of squeezed in in a boundary. Um, and you know, we talk about the body of knowledge. And a lot of scientific fields are self-contained units of knowledge, and a lot of scientists in them don't go beyond their field or are loath to go beyond their field. Um, and then you can weave and connect that, and it becomes interconnected knowledge. So knowledge can connect horizontally to similar knowledge or vertically to other fields. So you get something like a depth of knowledge, what we talk about, a depth of knowledge. Let me give you some analogies. So I think uh, genetics is quite a good one. Or, yeah, so you have um, atoms make molecules. Molecules form uh, DNA. DNA is collected in chromosomes. Chromosomes are packed into cells, and cells form organisms. And then you have something like um, weather. Weather's a good example. So you get your recordings from your um, temperature readings and so on. You structure them into tables, your weather tables. And then you read the weather tables and put it into a forecast. So it's a bit of information you can digest. The forecast and the tables all combine to create a body of weather information over time, which forms the science of climate, the climate science, packed in. And then that climate science can create link up with other fields like geology and um, astrophysics to create a, to model, to create a model of, of, our, of our weather so we can model reality with this connected knowledge. And I found that knowledge has some different qualities compared to information. Like information, for example, is very focused on the now. You know, news is a great example of information. You know, it's concerned with what's happening now, what is happening and maybe how it's happening. Whereas Knowledge is more concerned with how it's happening, but also why. So it's interested in the causes and consequences. And the more knowledge, the better. So it tries to be comprehensive. A lot of work here, a lot of information. Visualization allows you to compress a lot of knowledge in a small space. It's like the MP3 of knowledge, in a way. And we create the data very carefully, so it lives online, and it allows me to build some interactive uh, tools. Because another thing about knowledge is it's very complex. So you almost need interactivity to be able to play and explore with it. So I'll just show you a couple of little interactive things I've created. And first is the uh, interactive version of the snake oil graph. So this spawns itself in that spreadsheet you just saw. And it sits online, and you can then fil filter it. Show me heart what's effective for cardio. Roll over, get some information. And so it's now plugged into the data sheet so we can keep updating it. The data is now alive and online. So interactivity is necessary for knowledge because you need to be able to filter it and um, you know, play with it and explore it. So one thing that happens when you convert data to knowledge is that it becomes less quantitative. So you get, this is very machine, you can get machines to do this, but the machines become less and less involved and it becomes more and more human, it becomes more qualitative. And that's the type of data that often you can play with as well. So qualitative data is more people's opinions, decisions, their sentiments, and that can be visualized too. Um, an example of that is this image. Have any of you seen this image before? It's a visualization of the political spectrum. A concept map, so there's a map of concepts as they percolate down from government into society and culture and beliefs and background. And it's great to see how, you know, through contrast, you can see the differences and what each side stands for. I mean, on the left, you know, it's all about fair trade. On the right, it's about free trade. On the left, it's about the goal is personal freedom. On the right, it's about economic freedom. 
it's useful because often these groups, they're fighting for the same thing. They both want equality, they both want freedom, but they're actually fighting for different concepts. On the left, equality means a level playing field. On the right, it means opportunity. On the left, freedom is freedom from power and abuse. On the right, freedom means the chance to achieve or fail, to bootstrap yourself. Use the same language, but you know, have different intents. And interesting for me, creating this image as being a bit of a journalist and a left-leaning person, I would say, I very soon noticed how I wanted this side, left-hand side, to sound better than that side. You know, and the word choices and the nuances, but I couldn't do that because I'd create a visual, you know, broken image. So as part of my process, I had to really step into this side and really honor some of the perspectives there and really, you know, re recognize somewhat uncomfortably how much of myself was actually in that side of the diagram. But it wasn't too uncomfortable because ultimately I was just looking at a diagram. And when somebody tells you their political opinion or broadcasts it to you, you may feel like you have to defend. But looking at a diagram, it's like, it's just more unthreatening. And there's a clue in the language like, oh, I see what you mean. Oh, I see where you're coming from. There's a link between seeing and understanding and relating that maybe opens you up to be able to hold contradictory or opposing or conflictual views in you at the same time. Knowledge is powerful because it's, it's something you can apply to your life. We structure data, we consume information, but we apply knowledge. You know, we try and improve ourselves, we try and get better. So um, I'm just going to give you a little wide shot to end on. These are the top 500 passwords uh, visualized. 70% of all password and password stems appear in this diagram. And 9 out of 10 users use the same passwords on each site. And this is fun because I, I was able to do some qualitative work here and decide to find some categories of password that exist. And let me take you through them. Password access is a very common category. 5% of users have the word password as their password. 5%. And the next category is alphanumeric, simple alphanumeric. So 10% of users either use password, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or the admittedly higher security, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 as their password. <laughs> Then sports are very popular, as you might expect. Um, there's a category called rebellious. Trust no one, whatever, bite me. <laughs> um, nerdy is a big category, of course. Gandalf, computer, matrix. Then we have names. Names are a very big category. People use their names commonly. Animals. And there's a category called macho, like shadow, hunter, <laughs> hardcore. And then uh, a category I can only call fluffy. So it's like, sunshine, lovers, magic, heaven. <laughs> so there's the breakdown. So now I've shared this knowledge, you've given it to you, apply it, go home and change your password. <laughs> <laughs>